a good friend, brother in the Lord of the kingdom. Amen. Amen. Kevin Dunlap. He's the West Ridge Church multiplication director. And that's just a real official name to say that he loves God with all his heart and he wants to see the kingdom expanded. God connected us with uh, West Ridge as our partner church, I guess, what, 10 years ago, nine years ago, 10 years ago. And uh, we had a chance to travel with uh, Kevin in San Diego and uh, just his heart for pastors, his heart for missionaries, his heart for God uh, is impeccable. And you'll see that. Amen? Amen. So he said not to give him a long introduction. I just want to let you know, most of all, we love you. Amen. Amen. God bless. Amen. Go for it. Well, thank you, first of all, for, uh, for letting me come and hang out with you. Uh, my wife was, had a responsibility to take my youngest daughter to, uh, to Westridge today as they prepared to go to Nicaragua. So she wanted to be here and get to hang out with y'all as well. Um, I've got probably one of the best jobs in the world. I get to work with church planners not just locally, but around the country and internationally. And so the chance to hang out with Howard and Tecla uh, in San Diego was a, <coughs> pardon me, was a blessing. Um, I am from Ohio. I'm a Buckeye, so uh, don't hate me. Um, I went to the same high school LeBron went to. I was, I'm a little older than him. Um, didn't have the chance to teach him much back then. Um, but we've been on a crazy journey, uh, as God takes most of us on. And... Uh, you know, when I was talking to Pastor Howard, uh, we had a coffee a couple weeks ago, and I was talking about some of the journey we've been on. He said, I would love for you to come share that with the people to come. So, and my intention was to come and almost teach you, but this morning after I got a brief chance to hear some of your stories, um, you guys are doing this. Um, I think I'm here more to affirm you and to lift you up and to encourage you in that process. And by that, just our story. I've been with Westridge Church uh, on staff for eight years. Uh, my wife and I have been there for 15 years when we moved here from Ohio in January of 01. Uh, and God's crazy sense of humor called me out of the business world onto a church staff. I would have never thought I'd be here today, but again, his plans are different than my plans. Um, but on that journey, Westridge has seen ex incredible growth, roughly around 5,000 people on a Sunday. Um, but over the past five years, we've been on a journey to say, well, as we see so many people that have put their faith and trust in Christ as Lord and Savior, and we've seen so many people follow him in believers' baptism, the bigger question that we ask ourselves is, where are they now? Because some of them come and go, and that's not good enough. You know, as leaders of the church, we're going to be held accountable for that. How do we help? Our job is not to build the church. What did God's Word say? God's Word says that he would build the church, Right? and the gates of hell will not prevail. Yeah. Our job as believers are to love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, your mind, right? Yeah. Yeah. And to go and make disciples. Yeah. So as the church, we're called to go and make disciples. Yeah. Yeah. It's God's job to build it and to multiply it. All we're called to do is be faithful for those that he brings in our pathway, right? And we're to make disciples that would then make disciples. It's about reproduction, right? So, you know, and if you model the way Jesus did this, he didn't do it sitting in the synagogue. Jesus did this out in the highways and the byways, right? He did it in the messy places of our lives. He did it when they were carrying the wood of fear out, right? And her only son died. And what did he do? He took time to heal her. That wasn't in the heart of the city where all the, where all the conference was taking place. Where do they carry dead bodies? It's outside, because it's gonna smell. And it's going, to get, it's going to get ugly. It's going to get nasty. And Jesus did his best work in the fringes of society, not the center of society. And guess what? That's where we live. Where we live, work, and play is not in a nice, clean... I don't know about you. I don't live in a clean area. My family, my house, my neighborhoods are messy. I've got four kids, so that there explains to you that messiness happens. i got 25 to one that's turning 16 next week. And it's not easy. You know, I got a 25-year-old that my wife and I, you were talking about testify. Uh, my wife and I have been praying for boyfriend out of her life. And last week, they talked about they're going to take a sabbatical from going out anymore. So we're trusting God. I believe in that right now. Not that he's a bad man. He's just not equally young. 
I've got a 22-year-old daughter. She actually turned 23 on Monday, sorry. Um, she, she just left Thailand, heading to Malaysia. She's on an 11-month mission trip around the world. Um, and she's got a heart for God that blows me away. And I've got an uh, 18-year-old son um, that has been through some tough times. And we're loving him back into the kingdom. Um, not enabling, because there's a balance between those two, but we're loving him. And then we've got a 16-year-old. She'll be 16 next, this coming Wednesday. Um, she's a volleyball player. She, uh, she's crazy. She's not like any of the rest of them. Um, but she keeps us on our toes. So uh, we're living on mission where we live. It's a little harder where we work because we're, we're in an incubator. We work in a church. Um, that's why we intentionally do things like volleyball so that we can be out amongst people that don't yet have a faith journey. And then the last part is where we, where we play, like where we get to hang out. So, when I was talking to Pastor Howard, I was telling him that the uh, head of the journey that we've been on is how do we help ensure that we're accountable in discipleship, okay? And some of the things that I just want to kind of give you a backdrop real quickly, I'll be sensitive to time. You no, know, and it's if the church focuses exclusively on building small group community, they seldom get mission. But if we focus on mission, on people living outside, right? It's, it's risky, it's dirty, it's messy, but if we focus on that first, we get both mission and community. Because the community is what helps drive mission. Right? Yeah, so if we, if the church focuses exclusively on building small groups, the community, we seldom get mission. But if we focus on mission first, we get both mission and community. And Pastor, I'll send you my notes when I'm done, so that way you're not having to go crazy. Um, you know, the effective church now and in the future will be the one that equips, empowers, and mobilizes people to live on mission. Here's the deal. And this is the biggest thing, the revelation that we had to go through in this process. Living on mission is not an identity issue. There's an identity issue. It's not an event issue. The last thing you need is something more on your plate. You don't need more programs to come to a church. You don't need more things to do or more tests. It's not performance-based Christianity. Again, Jesus modeled it. When you look at how Jesus, when Jesus held the leper, right? How many, you got, how many know that story, right? He was walking, and the leper yelled to him and said, hey, heal me. Jesus could have easily said, you're healed, right? He could have done that. But Jesus was more about the relationship. He was more about people than he was about what he did. So what did it do? The Bible says he came up and he touched him. And as a rabbi, which he was, he was... He was reset. He was void. He could not do amongst society. They're like, you touched her? Really? But he, it wasn't about the healing. It was about the set people's expectations totally different. And so that for us, we got to look through those same eyes. And we got to say, God, why did you put me on this row on the airplane? Or why do I always go to this coffee shop? And I got the same loud person there all the time. Or for me, we live in, a, in my neighborhood. There is a guy that moved in about five, six years ago that has polarized our, our street. He is, you know, the cops have never been there, and they've been there 10 times since he lived there. Uh, his name is, is crazy. His name even spells crazy. It's, I won't say it because some of y'all might work with him. But um, as a pastor and as a Christ follower, more importantly, I know that I'm called to live on mission to reach the lostness of the people around me. Right. And it's a daily heartbreak. My wife and I pray for our neighborhood. We pray for our street. We pray, especially since this person has been put on there. The easy thing, kind of the American way, would be to sell my house and move to a different location. God didn't put me there by accident. Right. Yeah. My wife and I prayed this house, and God has us there. Until he releases us, that's our mission field. Right. Some of the mentality that we look at is um, about four years ago, we lost our worship pastor who was an avid cyclist. Um, he rode about 125 miles, miles a week on his bicycle. Um, and it was his Mac Daddy, the expensive one. Um, but he was hit and killed by a bus on Highway 41 for the half mile that he was on that road as he made a transition. Um, but God, God showed himself faithful and there about 4,000 people saw his, his uh, service online, and many people trusted Christ in the process. But the thing that I wanted to make a point on there was, 
several people, several of our people that are avid cyclists came up and said, we want to start a Christian cycling club. And that's our natural tendency is let's all huddle together as Christ followers. That's not what Jesus modeled for us. Our challenge, our counsel to them was you guys can meet together, pray together on Wednesday night, do whatever you want to do, but don't create a separate cycling club. Go out there and join a cycling club on a Saturday or even a Sunday. And, and this is where we got to learn to be okay with that. Then you gain influence with them. And then guess what? When you're done riding 30, 50, 70, some 100 mile crazy stuff that they do, you know, you're going to get back to your car and they're going to pop their trunk and they may crack a beer. Don't wig out. I'm not saying partake, don't partake. All I'm saying is you, we're called to live on mission through that process. Right. We've got to figure out how do we get out. Statistics say that 60% of the people out there will never walk into the Pecan Church or Western Church or North Star Church or anyone up and down this area. They're not going to do that. So if they're not going to come in, we're called to be sent out. Right? right? And so what Pastor and I were talking about, it's not just... We, the Big C Church, has done a disservice.